this week, uh, in the last couple of days, I was thinking about uh, something that people used to say a lot. I think it was in the 80s. So if you were alive then, remember back with me, people used to say these are the four rules for human life, that whoever is there is supposed to be there. Do you remember hearing that? And that whenever it begins is the right time. Whatever happens is the only thing that could happen. And the last one is when it's over, it's over. <laughs> I don't know why, but that just kept coming up into my, uh, into my mind this week as I was starting to prepare. Uh, to begin, I want to share uh, a quote from Rumi, the Persian poet, the mystical poet. And he said, through love, all pain will turn to medicine. I think, wow, what a tall order, that through love, all of our pain can turn to medicine for us. And I think we want to be in, in the love. I think that's the consciousness we want to bring forward on earth, is what we want to demonstrate in our life, a loving consciousness. Um, consider this, um, uh, because I've certainly been thinking about it, the many people that I've been talking to in the last number of weeks have experienced enormous stress and anxiety. You know, and I think, well, you know, what we have to do as students of the science of mind is that we have to replace that stress and anxiety with greater faith. You know, because it seems to me that if I have a lot of stress and I have a lot of anxiety, and some days I do, I certainly admit, um, then that is really the absence of faith. You know, it's time to cleave, you know, uh, like they say, to really hold tight to spiritual truth. This means that we have I think first we've got to know what it is we believe. In difficult experiences, in times when it doesn't seem like we are able to hold our faith, we have to come back to, wait a minute, what is it I believe? I believe science of mind teaches us that God is a principle, a power, and presence of love. That God is the love itself. And that God is good, and that life is good, and that all things are working together for good. And you, and I, right now, each and every one of us, we are a precious, be precious, beloved expression of the infinite mind. Yes, absolutely, you are and I am a spiritual, divine being having this little old human experience now. But remember, the bigger spiritual truth is that we are spirit. You know, that we want to be identifying more with the consciousness that we are, the spirit we are, the love that we are. People like to say, well, I'm only human. You know, have you heard, you, maybe you've even said that yourself. I have certainly said that um, in my pre-science of mind days. Uh, but what I've learned is that that is actually not true. No, you are not only human. You are really divine. In fact, the bigger part of you is this infinite spiritual component of you which, as I said, is, is infinite, it's, it's, it's all possibility, it's all potential, you know, and, and you happen to have this body, you know, of right now, because spirit on earth needs a body to complete the assignments that we're here to complete, right? So each of us has, I think, so this is what I come up with this week, that each of us really, really, really has to watch our self-talk, because it's from our self-talk our self-talk is the basis of feeling separate from God. And you know, we say in Science of Mind that any problem we have is because in that area we believe that we are separate from God. And right now, many people are believing that they are separate from God. And you know, that's not the truth. That is not what we teach. That is not the Science of Mind. The mystical truth of Science of Mind, and I say the mystical truth of Science of Mind because I believe Science of Mind is preparing us to move into more mystical consciousness, is that, you know, we, we could not be separate from God. We could not be separate from love. We could not be separate from each other. And so this self-talk that we have takes us straight to heaven, or I think it takes us straight to hell. What we have to do, I believe, what we have to have, we have to have enough awareness to not let what's outside of us control our thinking. You know, don't let the outside influence your inside. You know, because think of it this way: the outside is always happening, isn't it? There's always stuff going on out there. There's always discord. There's always activity. There's always appearances. There's always stuff out there. So don't think that the outside has control 
or don't allow the outside to have control of your thinking and don't let the outside influence your inside. That, because I really see that this is what most people do. Let me see what's happening outside today and I'll tell you how I feel. Let me see how things are in the external world and I'll tell you what kind of a day I'm having. That's the opposite of science of mind. You're having a great day if you choose to, regardless of what's happening out here. You get to be happy and peaceful and fulfilled and abundant because those are spiritual verities. Those are not based on anything external. Those are the truth of your being in here. You know, externals are always changing. We know that in the science of mind. Things out here, people come into our life and they go into our life and situations come and situations go. Um, the externals are, are just the last level of physical manifestation. That means that things have operated in consciousness for a long, long time before they finally burst through onto the physical level of manifestation. So if we put our faith and our security in something that is outside of ourself, you know, we're always, always, always going to be disappointed, you know? And, so this makes me personally, and I think it's, it's for all of us, if people are willing, that you know, our faith has to be in that which is changeless, that which is true, that which is eternal, that which is of God, that which is of love. We have to be discerning right now, I think. I think this is an extraordinary uh, time in the history of the evolution of the planet and the history of the evolution of consciousness. And, and to some extent, I find that I have to be a little bit detached. I have to be judicial about how much and whatever it is I'm taking in or letting in. And I think it's also wise at this time to think about who we let into our world, you know? Um, we have to make careful choices about what we're engaging in, in other words. You know, because science of mind teaches me that nothing and no one outside of me is the source of my good. And it seems to me that the world around us is constantly telling us that the source of our good is outside of us, the source of our good. Someone or something outside of us is gonna make everything so much better. But you know, things get better when we get better. I believe that is the spiritual truth. Things get better when we get better. When we show up as our most conscious, most loving, most forgiving, best self, then that's when the universe can respond to us in the most affirmative, ingratiating way. So again, science of mind teaches me that nothing, nothing outside of me is the source of my health. You know, that nothing outside of me is the source of my good. Nothing outside of me is the source of my abundance. Nothing outside of me is the source of my love. And on and on and on. And I know probably most of us have heard just the opposite of that most of our life. That someone outside of us loves me and something outside of me is the source of my health. But science of mind says those are all manifestations of the consciousness that is within you. You know, the source of all that is within me, the source of all that is within you, God, spirit, truth, does not change. And so to the degree that we think it's outside of us, it will seem to be. Why? Because, because there's spiritual law in operation. To the degree I think you have power over me, or to the degree I think someone has charge over my happiness, or whether I feel love, that will absolutely be my experience because there is spiritual law. Now we know, everybody here, I am certain, everybody here knows that love heals. You know, love doesn't solve problems, it actually dissolves the problems. So, and, and think about this, that every problem we have, that we think of ha the problems we have in our life today, at one time that problem was probably a solution to something else. Now, Emma Curtis Hopkins says in her book, The Gospel Series, to live as love, you have to forgive. Because forgiveness, what forgiveness does is that dispels the hidden fear. And that hidden fear is what's always trying to manifest, you know? Love begins with forgiveness. So when we get pulled out of love, I think any place where we get pulled out of love, that's where we need to be more forgiving. Remember, the world gets better when we get better. It's a funny thing to me that I think the hardest practice in the New Testament is the practice of forgiveness. You know, because the Old Testament is really about learning mastery of the law. And I would say in the Old Testament, the hardest practice to master in the Old Testament 
is tithing because people think they are their money. They think they are their, that's, that's their source, you know? And so we make that progress and we move out of the Old Testament, we come into the New Testament, but the hard practice in the New Testament, the hardest practice is to forgive. Why? Because everybody has a story about someone or something or multiple stories about someone's or something. And we cherish that story, and it's a story about why we should not have to forgive in this situation. Because this situation is so special. What this person did is so dastardly. It's so awful that it just can't be forgiven. But here's the thing. That lack of forgiveness only impedes our growth. It impedes our healing. It keeps us from moving forward in our life being everything that it could be. You know, this is the purpose, I think, of our earth incarnation, to develop the capacity to love where it's more difficult. You know, as I say all the time, we don't get any points for loving where it's easy. You don't get any points for loving your family, except on those days when they're really unlovable. You know what I mean, right? Humanity has, uh, I think, what I call situational morality, based on how we feel not on the greater spiritual truth. See, and I think what we have, we want to always bring the truth down to our circumstances. And I think that's backwards. What we have to do is that we have to bring the circumstances of our everyday life and lift those circumstances up to spiritual truth. You know, there's, uh, in some of the classes I teach, we talk about the law of worship. And the law of worship is this, that what you meditate on is what you become. Now, I'm not saying anybody here or anybody watching is, but just know that if what you meditate on, if what you think about all the time is it's all going to hell in a handbasket, that will be your experience, okay? And if what you hold to be true, what you meditate on, is all things are working together for good to those that love God, the Lord. That's what it says in the Bible. So everything's working together for good. Then that will be your experience. You know, it seems to me also, I've been thinking about this, that enlightened beings really abide in deep gratitude. Now think about this. If we could be in deep gratitude all the time, if we thank you, God, for my life, thank you for this day, thank you for my health, on and on and on, just really grateful, I think that constant gratitude is the experience of God communion, that we really get to experience our oneness with God when we're just in gratitude. You know, um, Emma Curtis Hopkins, who is one of my favorite teachers, she's just had a huge influence on me and my understanding of the teaching. She says um, that there are three outcomes for love, and I think this is great. And the first thing is that when you um, just love someone, if you're able to remove all of your opinion, or like she says elsewhere, I do not accuse the world or myself of any wrongdoing. Boy, that's hard sometimes, isn't it? You know, to just say everybody's doing exactly what they need to be doing in terms of their own soul's growth. Whew, that's hard. I find that, that, that that's, that's challenging. But she says, if you just continue to apply love to the, situa to the person, one of three things will happen. There are three possible outcomes. Are you ready? The first is they will go away. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? If you love, if you put enough love into the situation, because what happens is they will be lifted up into something greater for them, right? That that's, that's what happens. It's not like they're going down the drain. No, they get lifted up into something greater for them. So I have a great story about this. So I have a friend who was a civil engineer up north, and uh, he was the head of, uh, of his uh, department there. And there was somebody in the department who was just, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but the one person on the team who just kind of tweaked everybody else. They upset everybody else in the workflow, and they were always sort of like the, the adjutant in, in the equation. And so what my friend would do is every night, you know, of course, all the other employees were always complaining about this one person and stuff. And he said, but he knew that if, if the truth is true, it's always true. So every night after all the other employees would leave, he would sit in that one difficult employee's chair, and he would just pray prayers of love for him. 
for this person to be filled with love and for them to be happy and for only good things to come to them and on. Now, this is a hard practice. On and on and on. And he did this for a number of weeks every night before he left. And then one day he came into work and that person who was so difficult said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but I've got to give you my notice. I've been offered a great position in another state. <laughs> so they got lifted up and out into a greater good. Emma says that the second outcome of love is uh, that the person that we are working on having more love for, that they will have a shift, that they will seek to change in relationship to us. You know? So they will actually have a little spiritual realization and seek to be different. The third one, though, I think is actually the most powerful. And the third one is they stay. They keep doing exactly what they're doing, but your consciousness has been transformed by the love, and it absolutely doesn't bother you anymore. And I know we've probably all had that experience. I know I certainly have, where somebody will have been doing something or does something, and it makes me crazy. It makes me crazy. And then I do my work, and then I notice, oh, that doesn't bother me at all. Remember when that used to upset me? And I laugh, oh, my God, there is growth. Thank God there's growth. <laughs> you know, um, I think we have to say right now, I am peaceful. The, the God of peace exists within all of us, that the power of the Almighty is within all of us. We don't have to wait for circumstances to change or anything to be different for us to be peaceful. I love this idea because in A Course in Miracles, it, it says that that's really the goal for, the, for, for spiritual seekers, is to have peace, peace of mind. So I guess I'll end with this before we pray again, that whoever is here, is exactly who's supposed to be here. And whenever it begins, it's the right time. And whatever happens is the only thing that could happen. And when it's over, it's over. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment, recognizing that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite, loving, intelligent spirit. That the spirit of God, the love, the peace, the joy, the abundance, this is the truth about each and every one of us and every person on the planet. And we are all connected in the mind and heart of God, that there is only one here. And so I know we are blessed to be together this day on this beautiful new day, that God surrounds us and fills us and absolutely is the connection among all of us. And I speak this word that wonderful healing is taking place in each of our lives. And because healing is taking place in our lives, I know that healing is taking place in the world around us that we show up as healed beings with love in our hearts and minds that are open. We are free of our past and we look forward to the future and we know the path for each and every soul is bright. So we include in our prayer today our family members, our friends, our parents and children, all of those that we love and hold near and dear. And we know that right where they are, God is present, surrounding and filling them, ministering unto them, healing every heart, meeting every need. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in so that from our heart to the heart of every man, woman, and child on the planet today, we speak a word of light, a word of love, a word of blessing, a word of healing. May all beings know peace. May all beings know love. May all beings know healing. We bless our church and we bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams and all paths to God. I'm certain that we are blessed by being together today. So with a full heart, I give thanks that this is the truth. I release this word and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.